I'm going to begin with a bit of an apology. Unlike uh, perhaps every other paper today, I'm not going to be talking about the historical geography of Ireland or anything directly to do uh, with the Irish landscape. And I'm not even going to be talking about an Irish person. However, I am going to be talking about uh, scientific travel by a key natural historian of the 19th century uh, that was based uh, in Ireland. So bearing in mind that uh, time is of the essence here, I'm going to talk fast and take you on a little journey uh, across Europe um, with uh, David Moore. So here we go. At an evening meeting of the Royal Dublin Society in 1855, David Moore, creator of the Botanical Gardens in Dublin, observed, this long list of casualties will at once show that the commonly received doctrine of plants becoming acclimated rests on a very unstable foundation. The individual plants which are first imported never become hardier, but rather the reverse. But some seedlings from them may and do so. This conclusion arose from Moore's analysis of the effects of winter frosts on the outdoor collections in the Dublin Botanic Gardens. In addition to his observations about the effect of climate on plant survival in the Dublin Garden, Moore, during the course of his 40-year curatorship at Glasnevin, made several extended excursions to continental Europe, as well as regular trips uh, to Britain. He reported these findings at the evening meetings of the RDS, and they were subsequently published in the Proceedings of the Society. These trips lasted upward of six weeks in duration and were funded by the society. They were aimed at acquiring new plants, deepening the connections between the gardens in Dublin and other botanical and horticultural institutions in Europe, acquiring advice and knowledge on plant cultivation and glasshouses, and seeing how plants fared in different climates and habitats. Whilst ostensibly functioning to widen the network of contacts for the supply of plant material and deepen botanical expertise, they also served other purposes. Moore extended his accounts to include observations of agricultural practices in the countries he visited and anthropological commentaries on the patterns of livelihood and material culture of the populations that he encountered. These visits, therefore, provided him with insights into farming regimes, plant adaptability, garden design, and the cultural patterns of the agroeconomies of these places. These trips straddled the boundaries between educated travel and scientific expedition. They combined botanizing and fieldwork with aesthetic and cultural observations of the sites visited. Their reporting at the meetings of the RDS awarded them the imprimatur of one of Ireland's foremost learned societies of the day. In communicating his travel experiences back home, David Moore engaged in what John Agnew has referred to as the translation of time into space, whereby blocks of space have been labelled with the essential attributes of different time periods relative to the idealised historical experience of one of the blocks. Consequently, the organizing principle for his analysis of the places he visited was to situate them within a continuum of tradition to modernity. Following an intellectual trajectory whose origins itself can be traced at least as far back as the Europeans discovering the New World. This paper will focus on two excursions undertaken in the 1860s, one to Scandinavia in 1863 and the other to the Iberian Peninsula in 1867. For geographers, travel writing, of course, has had at its heart landscape description and interpretation. But as Gregory and Duncan have reminded us, this involved corporeal subjects, literally moving through material spaces. And their encounters with these real physical landscapes and their modes of transport through them were important in their renditions of these places. Modernizing and scientific travelers may have had a different panoply of material goods accompanying their trips than say missionaries, adventurers, or tourists, but all relied on more than the pen. Miles Ogborn has reminded us, writing itself makes fractious journeys through physical, social, and instrumented spaces. He says most attention has been devoted to understanding travelers' cultural baggage and not enough to what is in their luggage. 
Geographers have been particularly sensitive to the spatially informed literary practices underpinning travel narratives in terms of structure, chronology, digression, interpretive strategies, and organizing frameworks. From the perspective of scientific travel writing, Michael Bravo has stressed the increasing valorization of precision from the 18th century onwards. As he put it, precision had allusions to universal values as well as to personal qualities. First hand observation and accurate record keeping not only served to strengthen scientific claims, but also validated the status of the observer. And in the case of David Moore, enhanced his status as a serious scientist. Moore's excursions, therefore, occupy a transitional space between travel and scientific fieldwork, and echo Coley's description of the contact zones between landscape and landscape in the development of biology. Thus, while travel to overseas empires brought with it all manner of cultural and political baggage, travel within Europe was not necessarily any less replete with ideological or social hierarchies. As the appetite for gardening expanded in the 19th century, and as botanical gardens increasingly developed, they became centers for accumulating, displaying, and naturalizing exotics from around the globe and thus developing strong networks between botanical gardens, nurseries, plant hunters, and collectors was paramount. But if post-colonial theory has alerted us to the possibilities of critical engagement with the writings of travelers to Europe's overseas empires, it's also possible to see how internal exotic spaces are conjugated by travel within Europe. From the perspective of English landscape taste in the mid-19th century, Preston has highlighted how much of continental Europe was regarded as inferior to that of home. She suggests formal design, rigorously trained ornamental plants, ridiculous, fantastic trellis work, and geometric planting was held as the antithesis of the English garden ideal, and thus of free and liberal conduct of its government and populace. The flora of southern Europe was exoticized in ways not similar to that of Britain's overseas colonies. The ambivalent position of Ireland within a British context, simultaneously on its margins as well as being part of the centre, adds an additional layer of complexity when discussing more. David Moore, like previous curators of the gardens at Glasnevin, came from Scotland. Born in Dundee in 1807, he and his brother Charles both became directors of important gardens in Dublin and in Sydney. On a trip in 1856 to the Low Countries, uh, he noted that the objects the objects uh, for which I was desired by the Committee of Botany to undertake the journey being of a different nature than those generally induced by other persons to travel. Okay, now on to his first trip. In the early summer of 1863, Moore visited Scandinavia, a part of Europe unfamiliar to him, apart from being the birthplace of Linnaeus. With the approval of the RDS, he made his journey, accompanied by two companions, taking steamship from Hull to Christiana. With a brief uh, pit stop in Christiana, Moore noted the trees were flowering later than of ribbon, with sycamore, lime, and horse chestnuts doing well. And he noted the significance of fishing to the Norwegian economy. I quote, on leaving the harbor, we passed numerous boats sailing up and down uh, to the town with mackerel, which were all managed by women who appeared expert sailors. The fishermen who have their houses on the coast near the harbor go out to fish at night, and the women are ready to take charge of the boats in the morning. He met an Englishman, Mr. Goodman, who had a property in Sarsberg, and Moore got to examine local agriculture in some detail. They took a steamer up the fjord to reach the farm and noted the presence of Scots firs, uh, Bruce, birch, poplar, and juniper trees along the hills. Moore also observed the working of the logging industry along uh, one of the rivers, as well as being introduced to the crop rotation system uh, used on Goodman's farm. Following this part of the trip, Moore took a train to Eiswald, where he noted the milk cattle in the fields. From here, a steamer was taken along Lake Moisen to Lillehammer. Moore was very much taken with the beauty of this landscape. He, he claimed, to those who can relish the beautiful mixed with the sublime in nature, a sail on this lake is no ordinary treat. While the onward journey by four-wheeled wagon proved no less enchanting. 
He opined nothing could surpass the beauty of some parts of this extensive valley. The scenery appeared to me intermediate with that which occurs in many parts of Switzerland and that of some uh, of the deep highland glens of Scotland. At Vig, Moran's friends climbed some of the nearby mountains where he collected a range of alpine plants and some mosses. Having departed from his companions, Moore headed towards Dvorsfeld, taking a steep ascent across a mountain road, while a mountain road by foot, while his boy drove the carryall. Although 3,000 feet it is, assumed, uh, is the assumed uh, limit of Scotch fir, Moore saw it growing at much higher altitudes, and in this mountain's northern latitude was impressed how climate affects growth patterns. Moore managed to botanize considerably on this part of his excursion and found many desirable plants to bring home. The problem of transporting them, however, was a challenge, especially on the 300 mile journey back to Christiana. He noted that heavy luggage was the bane for travelers in Norway, as the carryalls or carts are too small to carry them aboard, and hence they must be attached by rope to the back of the vehicle by the traveler himself a task made all the more difficult as the horse and carryall is changed every seven to 10 miles. Moore made the journey as rapidly as possible to protect his plants and having packed them uh, and dried specimens in a good box, he sent them off to Hull by steamer. On all his trips, Moore made visitors and visits to prestige botanical establishments. Visits to botanic gardens not only allowed him to observe plants and practices in other establishments, but it also uh, involved valuable face-to-face -face contact. His first stop after his voyage was to the Botanic Garden of Christiana. He met the curator who gave him a tour of the establishment and he made a good list of desiderata. The climate of Norway had a big impact on war. He noted that coniferous trees, so beautiful in English gardens, were cultivated in pots in Christiana and moved to the conservatories in winter. During Moore's visit in June of 1863, the temperature rose to 80 degrees in the shade, and he noted that light and heat, but especially the former, being greater there during the summer months than with us, favoured the production of blossoms, which appeared to be brighter in colour and stronger in perfumes. Compared to home, the length of the growing season, however, impeded most of the fruits from ripening. On arrival at Sala, Moore immediately visited the garden. Having the opportunity to view the garden alone, Moore opined, I felt as if I was standing on hallowed ground, everything about me being almost sacred to the memory of the immortal Linnaeus. But time changes all things, as it has done with the celebrated system of botanical classification of this great man. Even at the very seat of learning and botanical garden where it was first promulgated by the author. The plants were now arranged into natural families according to the modern system. Moore made his way home, and I can't go into any further detail, but we did visit a, a, a number of other sites, made his way home um, uh, via uh, Germany. The second trip that I want to talk is a trip that he made primarily to Spain and Portugal. The final major trip he made during the course of his life as curator he undertook in 1867 in September, where he travelled to France, Spain and Portugal. While deep in the botanical network and extending exchange agreements, this trip also afforded more a chance to examine the usefulness of economic botany to agriculture and to observe the farming practices in these areas. Around Bayonne in southern France, he observed the profusion of pampas grass, which he claims attains a much greater size than it does in England. It is gratifying to see this plant, which we had introduced into Europe and distributed from Glasnevin Botanic Garden, now become so great a favourite with the people of the south of France. Moore travelled from Bayonne into Spain via rail to Madrid. Traversing the Pyrenees proved a very enjoyable spirit experience and Moore noted that it reminded him of some parts of Wales. On entering Spain, however, Moore noted the change in climatic and environmental conditions. He noted that, quote, one gets a very unfavourable impression 
direction of the country at any period of the year, but more especially during the summer months when vegetation is completely dried up and little else left uh, to his view, save here and there a few pines and oaks growing among masses of savage looking rocks. Near a villa, he observed the little villages and farmhouses were as miserable and as wretched looking as the country about them is. They are mostly long, lumbering, square-like edifices built for the most part with rough stones without any apparent plan. On reaching Escurion, Moore's attitude became a bit more positive as arable farming began to dominate. He proceeded by rail into Portugal um, and, uh, <coughs> and noted uh, there um, the sale of uh, vines, olives, melons, and figs at the railway stations, and he noted the very low prices. But he did also comment the weights used in some of these instances were of a very primitive nature, consisting of stones of different sizes. Of farming more claimed, where cereal crops are cultivated, the preparing of the ground is done in a very slovenly way, the surface being little more than merely scratched over with a small kind of plough. Madrid was the chief botanical garden visited, where Moore noted an entrance gate that was grand and imposing. But if the interior was equal to the exterior, the botanical garden at Madrid would be among the finest in Europe. Unfortunately, in his view, it was not. The garden was designed into four quarters, with herbaceous plants arranged according to their natural affinities. The collection, however, was small and cultivated with a good deal of difficulty owing to the heat and drought of the climate. Passing into Portugal, Moore visited the royal gardens at Sintra. Impressed by their location, he observed that they were extensive and laying them down, advantage had been taken of the natural beauty uh, of the bold headland on which the royal palace was at an elevation of 3,000 feet above sea level. In Lisbon, he visited the old botanic garden where he observed uh, the dragon tree, which is considered one of the largest of its type in the world growing outdoors. In the systematic beds, the plants he noted were grown according to Linnaeus, while in another area, they were grown according to the system of Lindley. Moore commented that, quote, it's interesting to see this old garden, which affords probably as good an example as is to be found of what botanical gardens were during the 16th and part of the 17th centuries. The conservatories are also of a very old-fashioned structure and were nearly empty at the time of our visit. At Valencia Botanic Garden, Moore secured a catalogue of plants um, cultivated there and an offer of exchange um, for duplicates from the plants in Glasnevin was made. He made his journey home through France. By way of conclusion, I think that uh, at least three um, themes emerge from the uh, two trips that uh, I've documented today. First, I think the trips were framed within a context of observation that was situated within ideas of tradition and modernity. Northern Europe was generally seen as innovative, agriculturally sophisticated, nicely designed villages uh, with well-organized botanical gardens. The Iberian Peninsula, by contrast, was treated generally but not um, exclusively as traditional, backward, and at times slovenly. The production of knowledge in this context, therefore, moved way beyond the scientific and became much more involved in a cultural interpretation of the spaces that he encountered. Second, climate played a major role in how the landscape and agricultural practices were conjugated. The cooler climates of Scandinavia, more akin to what Moore was accustomed to in Glasnevin, informed the way in which he reacted to the landscape whereas the hotter and drier spaces of Spain and Portugal created a visceral response that for him 
was conjugated as oppressive, difficult, and negative. Finally, the picturesque did feature in the manner in which Moore saw both regions, the mountainous areas of uh, Norway and Sweden in particular, were found to appeal to his sense of, of the sublime, while some regions of Iberia 